Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our hackathon showcase for 2021 virtual hackathon, our second year in the running. First, before we start, I'd like to thank Pocket Health for sponsoring our, our initiative. And um, thank you, Pocket Health. But next, I want to introduce our judges. Uh, we have, we're very fortunate to have six judges with us today. And um, when I introduce you, if you don't mind just saying hi, that way Zoom will put yellow rectangle around you and let everyone know who you are. First, we have uh, Dave DePokark, uh, sorry, DePokark, uh, ePatient Dave, who is a patient empowerment evangelist and chief patient officer at Pocket Health. Hi. Sorry for butchering your name there. <laughs> Next, we have Kevin O'Donnell, who is a senior research and development manager at Canon Medical Research. Hey, video technical difficulties, but hello. <laughs> Next, we have Dr. Amin Korchi, neuroradiologist and chief medical officer of Cerebru and director of imaging centers at Switzerland. Hi, thanks for having me. Next, we have Chris Hafey. Principal Clinical Imaging Business Development Manager at Amazon Web Services. Hi, everyone. Chris. Next, we have Dr. Walter Wiggins, Clinical Director at Duke Health Center for Artificial Intelligence in Radiology. Hi, everybody. And next, uh, last but not least, we have Mr. Herman Wusterwick, who is an expert <laughs> trainer and consultant working for OTEC. Hello, how are you? And I am Howard Chen. Uh, I work for Cleveland Clinic. I am your host for today's event. Uh, I also want to thank all our mentors, our co-heroes, domain experts. Without your help, this project would have been relatively boring because we can't get anywhere. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for all your involvement and for being active on Slack and uh, helping our hackers so that they'd be able to present the, the projects. Before we get started, officially, I want to lay out some ground rules. Uh, so here are the rules. Every team, uh, there will be there will be eight teams that are competing today. A ninth team. Uh, so the ninth team would not be for for a competing entry. It would be just sharing the work. But eight teams competing, nine total. There will be eight to ten minutes per team for presentations, plus one to two minutes for judges, questions, and discussions. That gives us a little bit of buffer at the end in case some of those sessions run long. I know one minute for question Q and A usually doesn't work that way. But that's what we have for you. Um, I will be I will be keeping time. So if you hear me inter interjecting in the Q and A, it's not because I don't like your project. It's because we really do have to move on. For the audience, if you are not presenting and you're not one of the one one of the um, judges or or uh, Mohana or myself, you have the option to vote for the audience choice award. And the link will go into the chat and. Um, what I will do after each session is to remind you of the names of the team and the project so that if it is one of the projects you really like, please do vote for it in, uh, for the Audience Choice Award. The winner for both the judging, uh, from the judging panel as well as from the audience will be announced at a SIM membership meeting on Tuesday, that's next Tuesday, um, the 25th of May, 6 to 7 o'clock Eastern time. Also, if you follow Mahana, uh, you will also find out the winners through the Twitter account. Now, without further ado, we are ready to start our showcase. So again, we have eight, uh, nine total teams and team number one is the Trachea Tracker Portable App. It is a, it is a flash, uh, flask, excuse me, flask-based portable application to query packs using Daikon Web that works even in a closed clinical network. And the presentation, uh, the presenter will be Dr. Sandor Kanya. Yeah, can everyone hear me? Yes. You got it, you're live. I see, I see you nodding. And I would like to ask, Sai, do you have audio? Can you speak? Yep. Yeah, okay, so my co-presenter, Sai Nathrayan is also there, so we can begin. Um, it is always good to begin with the presentation because you can be the first one to thank the organizers for the opportunity. And uh, I would like to then use this opportunity and thank for all the, the uh, opportunity to, to present this uh, uh, application that we um, developed only within the last uh, six days. On the 16th of May, we did not even know yet that uh, Hackathon uh, exists. 
but uh, last week and we saw the uh, newsletter and started to think about what could we do in such a short time and we came with an idea up and uh, I would like to show that to you. The name is Trakia, the Trakia Tracker Web Application and before we begin I would like to introduce myself. I am Dr. Konya, a radiologist, a neuroradiologist fellow, an interventional radiologist and AI fan. I have no um, training in, no academic training in programming, but I took part in relative uh, many massive open uh, um, Coursera courses that helped me to satisfy my curiosity and uh, need for further education. And Sai, could you please introduce you yourself? Hello everyone, I'm Sai, and I am a PhD student at the University of Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. I'm doing an industrial PhD with a 3D Shaper and Galgo Medical, which is a unit of Galgo SL. And I'm working on a project known as uh, Disk for All. It's a European consortium based project where we develop methods to understand and analyze the progression of intervertebral disk degeneration. And I started recently this March and uh, currently I'm working on 3D reconstruction from 2D X-rays and also working on texture based modeling of the intervertebral disks. Good. So we try to figure out what should we what should we do? And uh, there's a problem with the clinical radiologists and researchers who are working in a, in a clinic um, due to the lack of the opportunities to get um, bulk data, data, image data or clinical data uh, because uh, the clinical networks are usually closed ecosystems. The um, users has no rights or really restricted rights. And the IT departments are not really competent in such a, clinic and <clears throat> I was it was a really hard time to get a, a DICOM note for, for myself due to license problems and it is not flexible with fixed AI title could not use on every computer in the clinic and uh, we wanted to search for for um, on alternatives and we tried we we get crossed uh, on um, cornerstone which could have been used in the front end and the client side, but uh, sadly, our vendor in the clinic had the curse, of course, so we could not access the, the data so as we wanted. So we searched further and we come upon with a solution where we could utilize a portable um, full-blown Python development environment. Um, you can search up for the, the GitHub repo. And uh, we used this, this WinPython environment to install um, every framework and a server that could help us to uh, come over this, uh, this course issue. And we use the Flask as a lightweight server. And we have experience in, in um, Python programming and on the client side, the well-known um, frameworks Bootstrap and jQuery and Lodash libraries uh, to develop. We would want to, wanted to, to, to show you an example of use case and not just the retrieval of images uh, through this web application. And uh, we chose this um, segmentation problem, which is the segmentation of the endotracheal tube and the um, airways, not, not the wall airway, but the, the first division of the windpipe. It's called bifurcation of the trachea. And it's an uh, important task for every radiologist to uh, uh, look for this on a chest X-ray because the position of the endotracheal tube must be, um, must be set. And if it uh, is too low or too high, uh, it has to be repositions, so that's a therapeutic um, problem. And we took part in a Kaggle challenge recently, where sadly my team could not participate as much as myself, 
I ended up annotating 5,000 uh, X-rays for that, uh, the tracheal bifurcation. But um, what ended up good that one of the, without one, the winning solution could use this huge annotation data set for the winning uh, of this uh, Kaggle um, competition. And we we try to, to use this um, data set to develop our uh, trachea bifurcation segmentation program. Now coming on to the instance segmentation. So like when we compare the current state of the art instance segmentation methods to the previous years, one of the uh, most uh, famous solution is the mask RCNN method. So what happens in the mask RCNN method is that the algorithm first proposes a collection of regional proposals and the algorithms are used to train the regional uh, proposals into getting an accurate mask. So these uh, regions of interest could be uh, like uh, vertebrae or uh, for example, in our case, we uh, segmented the uh, trachea. And in the next step, what the uh, mask RCN method does is to classify these um, segmentation masks and then perform the mask regression. So when coming to our first stage, we have the object and region proposals. And then in the second stage, we have the computation of segmentation mask and the class confidence, like how well the uh, model is able to predict the bounding box and then the, also the offsets. Further work on the mask RCNN methods were much focused on improving the feature pyramid network. So like it's a collection of uh, convolutional batch normalization and activation layers, which are uh, collected over uh, together and then the features are compiled and then the projection is made on the localization and the mask confidence. So what are the main drawbacks of these two methods is that though they have a high accuracy, but they have a low performance considering the real time performance. So we need some model that does fast, fast inference on the real, real time. And also the models are more dependent on the localization of features. So here's where we use the YOLAC model, which is known as the, you only look at the coefficients. So what is this is that this is a one stage of uh, instant segmentation model. So when you consider an instant segmentation model, you usually have an object detection stage and also a segmentation stage. So in the first stage, what they does is that they uh, propose a, a new network called as the protonet, which accumulates a set of features over uh, interval, different intervals. Like here we have a 69 cross 69 image features over 246 channels. And then on top of that, we perform the three cross three convolution, we get the same features. And then we perform the one cross one to get 138 cross 138. And then similarly, we have the K categories of channels as the final features. In the step two, the mass coefficients of these features are calculated where here we have the class features, the box features, and also the mask features. So in the second stage, what usually happens is that we need to combine these two uh, stages together and then uh, perform a linear operation uh, on the mask coefficients as well as the prototype masks. So the second stage is usually a matrix multiplication and then a sigmoid uh, function is uh, operated on the output of the stage two. And finally, you get the uh, instant segmentation mask for which there are four different types of losses. One is the mask loss, one is the class loss, and the other is the segmentation loss, and also is the bounding box loss, which regresses the uh, bounding box so that the accuracy, accuracy is even better. Gentlemen, you have one minute. Okay. And in this remaining minute, I would like to demonstrate how the program works. I hope I can then you reload this page that is going to live query the SIEM Hackathon server, found seven images on the server and started to inference them and shows the inferenced image and the annotations on each image. It is uh, pretty, pretty slow right now. It went a little bit faster this afternoon. I wanted to show you some examples that I just queried from the uh, from the web. It shows really good results with the exact position of Carina and, and the tracheal tube. Here shows also an overlapping two um, areas. We calculated the 
intersection over union um, value. And if it uh, is more than 0 0.7, then we said that the, this is an anomalous, so anomality. And I just would like to show you how it looks like when anomality is detected. Uh, restart here. Yeah. I just see a desktop notification and I can open then the case in the background uh, with a CLI comment. Um, and that is good when the radiologist maybe doesn't have this application and on the yeah. desktop running, but you are it's at time. somewhere on the, um, on, the, on the background. So basically I wanted to, we wanted to prove that it's possible to use a portable application to get to the pictures and also to integrate um, ML um, scripts in the pipeline. And it is also within five, uh, five days possible. So thank you for your time. And thank you, team um, number one. Questions? Um, judges? Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, judges, please so, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I assume that you use Dicom Web to retrieve the images. I was wondering how you would, whether you have already a solution to store the annotations or whether you're thinking about how to store the annotations, whether you want to have that information sent back to the packs or what are your thoughts on that? It was, the intention is to make a flagging system. So okay. like a prioritizing of the, of the reporting of the images. If the, if the system detects an anomaly, a low position of the endotracheal tube, that image has to be reported pretty fast because it's a therapeutic decision that has to be made whether this endotracheal tube should uh, pull back or reposition. And okay. that's also, that's, that's the main intention to have a flagging and prioritizing system to show which image needs your immediate attention. So it's AI triage. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions for team number one? I was kind of in the same vein, I guess, uh, you know, Dr. Konya, how would you see the, the workflow for this going? So would the idea be that these patients would be scheduled for a periodic, uh, you know, position check x-rays and you would somehow detect which ones were for that purpose and then, you know, uh, flag those for the radiologist or? So we, we have in our clinic, in our system, we have the bedside images named always uh, with the same words and that's the filter for these images that could possibly contain endotracheal tubes. Mm -hmm. None other, the not bedside images uh, are not usually, uh, so they do not contain, but the patients uh, are not on, on the intensive care unit, so they don't have an endotracheal tube. So this is a niche application only to detect this uh, narrow uh, pathology. So that was the filter, but maybe later we could we could add a classification script too, that helps us to identify the chest X-rays if the uh, series description is not enough. Thank mm -hmm. you. That was team number one, the trachea tracker portable application. Next, we have team number two, case mm -hmm. tracking project. It's a software able to capture a screenshot of a radiology image and metadata such as modality and body part, all in a user-friendly interface for case tracking. The presenter is Vadim Kurtzukov, sorry, uh, Kurtzukov. Uh, and Vadim, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. So uh, this is Sina, uh, another person on the team. Uh, I'm going to give the introduction of Vadim is going to continue with the demo of the software. So yeah, uh, hello everyone. I'm Sina and uh, one of, I'm a radiology resident in Pittsburgh. Uh, this problem that we are trying to solve in this hackathon is about case logging and keeping track of cases. As, as you know, all of the radiologists are dealing with this problem and uh, it's a really time consuming process. There is need for 
case logging in education, credentialing, uh, possibly billing, and uh, we are spending a lot of time in uh, doing this during our practice. In addition, uh, we also take uh, save lots of images for our presentations, case conferences, or uh, just taking pictures for keeping them or sharing them with the with our colleagues. Uh, we try to find a solution uh, for these two processes by designing a software which universally can uh, keep track of cases, easily log, keep track, and also uh, take screenshots and save the images in an appropriate way for future reference in a safe way. Uh, Vadim is going to uh, continue and show us the demo of this software. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so the pro prototype of this uh, solution, uh, I chose to make it simple, local, no, you know, uh, remove extraneous complexity. And to achieve that, I just used Excel as a data storage and just a designated folder for, you know, archive of the cases. Um, for user interface, uh, based on what I've heard, I chose to use kind of a, a clicking and tagging as opposed to typing, minim minimizing the uh, typing and input and uh, make it as fast and kind of uh, uh, easy as possible to quickly uh, write down some notes and, and save this for later. Um, uh, uh, there is a need to uh, capture a few things, possibly a screenshot, um, and everything is going to be stored locally. Uh, so no sharing, no uploads, none of the security implications. Um, it's, a, it's a mini my personal favorites archive, basically. Um, and um, based on the three iterations that happened in the past two days, three different versions were uh, built and reviewed and enhanced. The final version included ability to have just a uh, localization of like, which hospital are you uh, currently working at? Uh, because some people attend multiple, go to multiple places, uh, multiple sites, and just recording a case doesn't necessarily um, give you an idea where you saw it if you come back to it later. So there's just a basic need of, you know, to, to know which system, which uh, health system and which PAC system you saw that a case at. Um, and then the ability to anonymize, um, for some cases, you actually don't want to store uh, PHI information. So uh, a system, the, the software will allow for this stripped down um, storage. So the prototype, these are the screenshots, would be a tiny little app, uh, simple save to log button. The user interface, as I said, has a ta tag style of ta like tagging which modality, which study, um, type in the protocol description, uh, male, female stuff, MRI, or I'm sorry, MRN accession information, quick type note of what, why is this interesting? A few checkboxes on the bottom that uh, are allowed or allow you to uh, track and, and enter, is this good for local conference? Is this uh, for, uh, national or society level conference. Uh, is this for a paper you're writing, you know, manuscript stuff. And then um, you don't see there's a dollar billable amount thing, but in a special case when this could be potentially used at certain sites where radiologist reads and then has to keep a log and maybe write down the amount. I mean, we I saw one of the templates uh, shared that contained that field. So. It's an optional feature. None of the fields are required. All are uh, simple uh, data points with a possibility of multi-tagging. So if a study for some reason contains um, head and neck and spine, you can actually tag all three. They're gonna be aggregated all together. So if you search your Excel repository of data, you will find the case regardless of which uh, keyword you're gonna search for. Then there's ability to grab a snapshot, um, and I had to simulate my. Um, I, I don't. I'm, I don't have any uh, reading 
uh, software, so I can't see X-rays. I am not gonna wasn't going to. But I, what I did, I just made a fake uh, reading workstation screen that I used, um, and uh, the picture you see of the cup is actually an entry in the Cleveland Clinic uh, Imaging Institute art uh, contact contest from prior years from one of my colleagues and i thought it was really cool so um the software allows you to identify you know, select the region to grab and you can capture several of these um so you have uh you know data plus the images all there and then you just hit save so um when the data is actually recorded in the back end um in excel this is what it looks like. Uh, the log ID is a combination of date and timestamp, so acts as a serves as a universal or unique uh, identifier, as well as the date timestamp. Um, the green fields are, you know, hospital study, body parts, protocols. Red fields or highlighted in dark orange are the patient info. POI is the Note that why is this case here? Why is it interesting? The three flags are local conference, society or manuscripts, um, and then dollar amounts and the case folder. The case folder column actually is a clickable hyperlink. So when you click on it, uh, as you can see, there's a, on the bottom, there's a finger thing. When you click on it, uh, it opens up this image folder with all the images that you save as part of that entry. So it's like a skeleton style, um, the, you know, notepad thing, <laughs> Story, uh, quick notes, I don't know. Um, all right, so now I guess it's the time to do a demo. Uh, switching to, you can still see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, so here's my little save to my log application. Uh, I'll move it like here. You have two uh, minutes. You have ability to select the location. Uh, this is the viewer. Uh, in, the per in the first iteration, the viewer was defined and the system automatically grabbed the screen, but it was just uh, extraneous info, which was part of it, which was not really uh, needed. So uh, in the third iteration, if you start the note and you define some parameters, I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Um, I want to say I want to grab this. This looks good. I'm going to add this and the system said, OK. And I want to maybe grab uh, this. So OK. That is fine, I can say that, but then I maybe I actually don't need that one. So I'll keep this one. And um, I'm gonna write this out. And of course it's gonna probably fail on me, but um, this is due to the last minute enhancements. Uh, the resulting thing works. <laughs> and here's the archive entry, or here's my local archive. So let me... Make sure it is. Okay. It's not responding now. Oh, breakpoints. Okay, never mind. So um, the archive is right here. Here's my last entry. Here's what I just typed in. And if I click on that, it opens the uh, archive folder, and there's some test images that I've done before. It just sequentially creates screenshot one, two, and three once it's uh, processing that. Um, You're at 10 the, minutes. That's time. Uh, OK. That, so future enhancements, encryption, um, the drop down of protocols, uh, cap, uh, annotations for the captured images, and customizing actual Excel file with column order and um, maybe saving that as a profile. That's it, any questions? Thank you, Vadim. 
Uh, that Thank was you. that was group number two case tracking project. Uh, judges, questions. Yes, thank you very much, Mike Case Log, uh, the, for the great presentation. Uh, if you uh, would like to uh, develop further the Mike Case Log, uh, what are the features that you could imagine uh, to make my Case Log have a, a larger uh, impact beyond a personal case log or a personal local case log? Um, so there. There are some things that, uh, based on what Sina and Pedro was telling me, there might be some uh, usefulness of, for that for the uh, residency for tracking education or. But I have to let them speak to why we're doing this. I, can I mean, talk a little bit. So I think that the ideal application would work anywhere in any computer, and it would be. Uh, linked to your credentials, like something that you could log in. It could be a web application or a software, um, like a thick client. And you would be able to um, uh, store all those metadata and large volumes of, of um, like large sizes of images, including DICOM, ideally. So if we, if we could do that, and if it were HIPAA compliant and easy to use, just like I can go somewhere else and and use my Facebook anywhere else, and it does have my my personal identifiers there. If I could use that, if I could do the, have the same safety and uh, freedom to use that application anywhere in the world, I could have a, a lifelong record of of cases. Uh, Ideally, in it would addition, be like a like a Google Drive essentially that you can ha you can have folders within it, and you can have that portable, all in the uh, cloud. I also wanted to add uh, one additional use is that we, it can be shared between users and uh, like we can send cases to our colleague in another health system and hospital completely independent with uh, like these art screenshots. And one additional thing that we want to do is uh, customizing the cropping of the images. So now we basically did like a screenshot of the whole screen, but we can manipulate the cropping, add arrows and annotate the images and save them and multiple images. Just a real quick comment. Um, I, I think one of the other feature enhancements that would be really nice is to pre-populate or post-populate some of the clinical metadata by doing like either a fire call or a DICOM web call based on the accession or, or something along those lines to try to um, reduce the amount of potential uh, human error introduced by and reduce the, the barrier to logging a case by um, utilizing some of those APIs. Thank you, judges. Yeah. And thank you for team number two, case tracking project. Next, we have team number three. ROSA stands for Radiology On-Screen Assistant from the Cleveland Clinic team. It is an unobtrusive on-screen radiologist assistant for providing contextual integration between client apps running on a radiologist workstation. And Lindsay, as soon as you're ready, Hi. take yes. it away. Um, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Lindsay Marrero. Good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you happen to be today. Um, I am representing Team Cleveland Clinic, and our hackathon project this year is what we have dubbed the Radiology On-Screen Assistant, or ROSA for short. Um, here we go. Okay. Um, our team this year was a collaboration of different people from different backgrounds. Um, we have our imaging data science team from the Cleveland Clinic. We also have our medical physics development team. Um, and we have two students from John Carroll University, um, and they are computer science grads. So it was nice to be able to... Um, Lindsay, as a reminder, if you're uh, looking to present your screen, you're not sharing. Oh, thank you. One moment, screen share. Nope. Okay. Better? Yes. Awesome. Okay. You didn't miss much. This was the only the second slide. <laughs> All right. Um, so our challenge this year that we wanted to develop a solution for 
was, um, you know, we all know that radiologists use multiple different applications with multiple different vendors all at once. Um, there's no consistent client integration. Um, and, you know, in, I, in, I, in an ideal world, we would have, you know, our wrists talking to dictation, PACs talking to EMR, EMR talking back to wrists, whatnot. Um, as you can see, it gets kind of spaghetti-ish down here. Um, so we really um, need, and there are standard integrations now um, that do rely on HL7 messages. They're very proprietary. Um, because of those messages, you could potentially have network latency. Um, and, you know, they're custom built for each integration. So there really is a need for um, a vendor agnostic integration solution. Um, and big picture, you know, from a radiologist standpoint, we need this contextual awareness. So, um, you know, a radiologist really just wants to know that program A is um, talking to program B. Program A, we want to know what's happening in program B. So our idea for a solution, um, and special thanks and shout out to um, Dr. Chen and Dr. Polster from the Cleveland Clinic for helping us with this idea and providing some inspiration for this, um, is ROSA. And ROSA stands for Radiology On-Screen Assistant. Um, it's basically, the idea behind it was we wanted it to be an unobtrusive assistant um, that is present but not distracting. Um, it will automatically detect events that are happening on screen, whether data is placed on a clipboard or maybe there's a value within a UI element um, in your PACS, RIS, dictation, et cetera, system. Um, we needed to have contextually suggested actions, such as, you know, hey, I've detected a patient ID. Do you want to view priors? Do you want to open up the patient in an EMR? That sort of, um, those sort of suggested actions. Um, and we need to use quick access to actions via the FHIR API calls. So now I'm going to hand it over to um, one of our students, Jess Marola to walk through a demo. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so for this example, um, we want you to imagine that you're a radiologist and you're working on dictating a report for a patient named Joe Sim. Um, so Lindsay has that example pulled up right now. Um, and as you're working on this, you might find yourself wishing that you had quick and easy access to more of Joe's information. And this is where Rosa is going to come in. So this whole time, Rosa has been running quietly in the background. And you could see the symbol, um, the little widget in the corner at the bottom of the screen. And so now if we highlight the text, so highlight the patient ID um, and add that to the clipboard, Rosa is going to be notified. And you can see that through the highlight. And so once we have that added to the clipboard, um, we can open up Rosa if we want. Um, and you can see that we have two features that are currently implemented. So the first one we're going to take a look at is the um, loads, load patient studies feature. So We'll pop that open. And just from adding that patient ID, we can see the patient's information along with a list of studies pertaining to that patient. So you can view the information or you can select a specific study and hit the button. And that's going to take us to a PAX viewer. And now we can view the images pertaining to that specific patient. And we have a second feature as well that I mentioned. And in this case, it's Google and whatever. You can Google whatever's on your clipboard. Um, and so that'll function pretty much as it sounds. But what our plans would be for that is rather than being able to Google something, um, you would be able to take whatever saved your clipboard in the future. And instead of Googling, you would be able to search that clipboard piece um, within our internally developed radiology search engine. So obviously that wasn't quite available for the scope of this current hackathon, um, but it's one of our future ideas. And I'm going to pass it on to um, my fellow student, Chase, and he can talk a bit more about those next steps as well. Hey, Jess. Wait a moment. So our next steps for Rosa would include the following. You can go to the next slide, Lindsay. Thank you. Um, we would want to include a way to look up by study ID 
as well as include user-driven application configuration. So this would allow users to configure Rosa for EMR, PAX, and RIS. Uh, we would also want to give the ability to open patient information in EMR, RIS, or dictation. We would also want to add a capabilities to open my case log for studies being reviewed. Uh, and this was the previous hackathon project that you just saw actually. We would also want to include a report checker, which would specifically you look at subs, um, subspecialty specific uh, quality checks against the current report open. And there are many other uh, things that we could look at. This is just the beginning for Rosa. We can add many other things, even through something like a custom script. I will now pass this to AJ, who will go over Sonar Cube for our, our project. So as part of the hackathon, we had the opportunity to try out Sonar Cube. Uh, Sonar Cube is a code review tool that helps identify bugs and other issues with your source code. So after you install, configure, and run the Sonar Scanner, you can then view the results in the Sonar Cube website. Um, so here on the left, we have a view of our dashboard after we ran a scan. Uh, you can see it's got one security issue, 109 code smells, which is code that is confusing or hard to support, and seven hours and 40 minutes of debt, which is the estimated time it would take to correct all the issues that it found. Um, it also keeps a history of each time you rescan or refresh the results, which is on the right there. So this graph is showing our issues increasing as each time we refreshed, ideally that would go down. Um, you can also drill down into specific issue details. Here is a code smell issue for cogn cognitive complexity. Um, it shows you the code that it identified as problem code. It highlights areas um, that it thinks are is confusing and should be modified to make supporting the code easier. Um, Two minutes. Due to time constraints, uh, we didn't follow up with any of our reported issues for this project, but uh, we can see this as being a helpful tool within the software development lifecycle. So we did decide to open source our code this year. It is in GitHub. Um, and we are just waiting on administration approval from the Cleveland Clinic just to make sure that um, you know we're good to go. But it should be with um, you know, we, we're hoping that it will be out there. Um, and we do have a reference to the report checking software that we, um, that we referenced prior. Um, and then our hackathon experience, um, you know, we were successful in proving that this application can exist to tackle a solution that, or ta we tackled the solution that's plaguing many radiologists out there. Um, this was a virtual experience, obviously, this year, and everybody had their own like modular components that we tied together at the end um, that worked out really well for it being virtual. Um, we worked with students this year and multidisciplinary teams, which was great. Um, shout out to our code heroes, because there were quite a few times where um, we were like, oh, how does that work in fire? What kind of call do we need? So that was really helpful. And um, Sonar Cube was a great ad this year. Um, it was a great opportunity to, to use that this year. Um, with that, we can take questions. Thank you. Judges? I have a question. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> let's say, um, by the way, I like it, but let's say we have a name John Smith. You highlight John Smith. And I would imagine that there are probably maybe, if you take the Cleveland database, a hundred thousand matches. How do you um, think you're going to filter out multiple responses? So that's a great question. Um, right now we have it set up with patient ID, which um, is pretty like that is the unique patient identifier. Um, and as part of our next steps, we were thinking about using a study ID as well, but due to time constraints, that was um, an issue. I don't think we, we talked much about using a patient name because yeah, that would cause um, quite a bit of a problem if you've got multiple John Smiths. Um, but ideally, I mean, it would be nice to come up with a, um, like a pop-up maybe saying, hey, did you need this person or this person? And then maybe validate with those two patient identifiers, right? So like um, patient ID and patient date of birth or something like that so that we can properly identify the patient. I think that would be a really nice add. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I you mentioned, oh, go ahead. I, have you thought about uh, a more 
automated way of capturing the context rather than having to use the clipboard. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that was that the question? Yes. Well, and, and actually, I'll I'll supplement the question because I was thinking along the same lines. You mentioned using the Fire APIs uh, specifically. Yes. Did you look at Firecast? Because this would seem to be uh, really well aligned with uh, to Chris's point uh, to have the program help queue up some of the context. I think the clipboard is handy for additional context, but okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not familiar with Firecast. Um, I'm not sure if any of my other team that my other team members might be um but so you're saying that um maybe we could queue up some um some different yeah. identifiers F firecast was intended to be sort of a context synchronization thing so that it's a bulletin board and when one app says well all right we're opening patient x it throws up the current patient id the current accession number and any other apps that are saying hey if we've moved on let give us a ping and they can go look and say oh we're on this patient now um, and so it's a it's a way to have sort of background uh, to Chris's point. Um, you could have you could automatically be syncing up on the patient. Now some of the other things, if you have a particular diagnosis, you know that would be a little more complex. So, yeah, so. I mean that sounds like it would lend itself really well to yeah what we were what we were looking into. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be really cool because yeah, it is kind of cumbersome right now. Right now it's relying on it being in the clipboard. <laughs> which yeah. isn't ideal, right? You know, you don't want to have to like select somebody in your clipboard and or select somebody in your report and add it to your clipboard. So yeah, um, yeah definitely open to other solutions with that. Yeah, Firecast is really the modern way of doing CCAL, which is the old way of doing context exchanges. So you might want to look at those. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Great. judges. And um, Thank sorry, you. we do have to move on to the next presentation. Some of the conversation continue in the chat for some of the uh, presented projects as well. So I encourage everyone to check check in the chat if you want to continue the discussion. But we do have to move on to, so sorry, that was team number three, Rosa, radiology on screen assistant from the Cleveland Clinic team. Next, we have team number four, I think it's pronounced Pokerad of uh, Gamify Radiology. It is a Proof of concept radio resident training system with gamification elements. Users accrue experience points and level up based on performance, which in turn unlock other training modules. Team number four, Pokerad, when you're ready, uh, take it away. Can you see my screen and, and hear me well? Yes. All right, so this is Pokerad. I'm just representing this large group of amazing people. I'm presenting for the first time. I'm a uh, radiology resident here at Boston University. So just a little bit of background. So there's a problem. Each radiology resident throughout their residency will see a different set of cases. So for example, it's the luck of the draw. One resident will see five cases of cardiac amyloid, for example. The other will see, you know, will become very familiar with lung rats. The other will have, uh, will witness many cases of severe trauma, but the other resident will not. So how could we help solve the, this problem? How can we ensure that all residents go through a similar set of cases throughout residency? So we could implement training sets, for training modules for specific skills. For example, a training set that a radiology would do that would have them become trained in lung rads or in bi rads or like a call prep sort of uh, training module. And you can use AI techniques and gamification to make it more engaging. So what is gamification? Gamification is the application of elements of game, of ga uh, video games especially, to make something more engaging and fun. So these are examples of game design elements that we apply to things to make them more engaging. You can have a point system, you can have badges, you can have leaderboards, performance graphs, meaningful stories, avatars, teammates, so what is the evolution of a radiology resident? So all the kids from the 90s on this call know these uh, pocket monsters. Uh, so you start as a, uh, with a Charmander and they evolve and then they evolve again. So what level do they evolve? And I know that you know that. In your memory, you probably already know what level they evolve. Level 16 and level 36. So a resident is kind of like a Pokemon in that sense, right? So your objective is to become a Charizard as an R4, a resident of 
of the fourth year, fourth year residents. So at that point, you're, you should be able to work independently, participate in tumor board, but maybe as an R2 or R3 here in the middle, you should be able to take call and be very effective on call. So there is a sort of pre, a pre-specified level of evolution, even for residents. So we had an idea that was kind of like this. If you had sets of modules, one set of module for each skill that you want to evaluate or train on. So for example, lung rads, you could have four sets of modules. So these squares are sets, uh, so are, are modules. So you would have one set of module for lung grads and at the end you will get a trophy, for example. Now. For example, cancer staging. Maybe in order to start your case, cancer staging set, a module set, you would have to have gone through the lymph node training uh, set of modules, and then this will unlock the cancer staging because because it should be really good at uh, seeing the lymph nodes that are abnormal and giving them the right name. So one set of module will have many modules, and each module is kind of like a dungeon and could give a maximum number of experience points, XPs. And each module is a little bit difficult than the prior module. And each of those modules can reward up to a predetermined number of points. And it will cover a certain level of difficulty and tell you how much you got right. Um, one example that we could do, uh, that we could, uh, one way we could apply this with is with image segmentation and annotation. So for example, if images are annotated with the ground truth, like these ones, maybe the radiologist is the ground truth and then the resident is trying to find the finding and uh, this, this particular resident got 60% correct. Maybe 60% will reflect six XPs out of 10. And then, you know, throughout the entire dungeon, maybe there's 100 cases, so a maximum of 1,000, but the, the resident got 850 XPs, right? So the XP, the XPs will go to this resident's total pool of XP, and they will climb up the ladder until they go up in level in multiple points. So let's say this is a resident. Uh, if he's a level six, maybe one day he'll be a level seven like that, right? And you will have some, some visual cue saying, hey, you went up a level, great job. Keep at it, right? And then maybe you could apply leaderboards. So, you know, this resident here is in first place and got a trophy, got a, you know, uh, a crown. And then there's a, someone who's in second place, third place. And you could have rewards, trophies, badges, specialty related badges or streaks and uh, trophies. So what did the, what, why to do all that? We'll go through all this, right? Maybe you'd have something like this. You need to be a level 30 to be okay to do call, for example because they already they would know that you're very effective at that. Uh, maybe you would be level 45 to be able to present a tumor board, maybe a level five to uh, lead a clinical project. And the other advantage of this dungeon system is that you would ensure a similar pool of cases for that, those training modules for all residents, right? So this is an example of a TB detection. So these TB images were available to us and there is a ground truth annotation and then we annotate these images um, on this open source software, VIA. In this example, there are, uh, there's this marking that is six, let's say 60% correct. The second step would be to calculate something such as a dice coefficient score from zero to one, right? So zero, the person is completely off and one is 100% exact. Like you see in this drawing here, dice of one is completely correct. The third step would be to assign an XP score per dice score. So let's say multiply by 10, 0 0.8 dice score would give eight experience points. And then step four would be to sum the XP for each image annotated to calculate the XP for the entire dungeon. And then you would have, uh, you could have a leaderboard and leveling. So this is what we did so far, right? And 48 hours and, and what we, what uh, Dr. Les Folio has worked uh, recently as well. There is this single one-stop shop for everything related to annotation. And the, uh, you have annotation training, publicly available images, how to download the VIA open software, open source software, how to upload the JSON for instant score. And then we use these two, we have used these two data sets so far, 27 patients of COVID-19, 68 of TB. And then there are many, many of us who already went through that very quick training or successfully um, 
like we were able to successfully annotate those images. The time range depends on your training. We had students do it as well. And we had, uh, you know, fourth year residents. And this was the first leaderboard that we did. This is, so to speak, version 1.0. So this one was based on Kappa statistics and we were able to just rank the, the uh, imagers, the, the, sorry, annotators uh, based off of the Kappa statistics. But now in version 2.0, thanks to our wonderful code heroes, we were able to um, do something a little bit better. So this, this one is for the TV um, annotations and uh, João, one of our code heroes, wait, or was able to create this little website that you can just drag and drop your JSON file and submit, and the leaderboard gets populated automatically there. So this is us having our first demo. On your left side, you see the happiness of a working demo uh, during minutes. conference. And then on the right, you see uh, the little thing being populated. So I don't know why Marcelo is not that happy, because he is first place on the leaderboard. But maybe it's just because he knows it's just two people on the leaderboard so far. So he's a realistic guy. So the demo we have is this little video in which um, Marcelo is inputting his name. It was Eduardo's score, so he's typing Eduardo's name. And then he has the JSON file that he got from those annotations. He's just going to drag it into the drag and drop field and then I guess he gets confused with the mouse for one second and then submits, right? So as he submits, you see Marcelo is there and Eduardo is there as well, okay? So for the future, now we want to streamline the existing methods and codes that we've got and uh, have some real-time real leaderboard updates, um, build up on Siva's work as well, who works with uh, Dr. Les Folio's folio on these things. We can out automate this process, apply the same rationale to other kinds of tasks like reporting or some sort of online form. You can click through things and choose a long grads category, for example, uh, use other modalities, something that you can scroll, a nicer user interface, uh, an interface with a profile, with authentication. And uh, we think that the potential of something like that is to revolutionize the radiology training and evaluation. Maybe something like this could replace an OSCE or multiple choice questions because you have uh, a track record of what kinds of modules that this resident did, right? It could also replace our boards, maybe an oral boards 2.0, um, maybe identify students with talents and also create crowdsourced annotations. For example, this is uh, uh, Les Folio's work with uh, crowdsourcing annotation and how he can create heat map plots showing where these annotations you are, are 10 minutes. so that you have uh, this is essentially it. So a shout out to everybody help me and thank you so much to allow me to participate in this uh, hackathon. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Judges? Thank you very much. Great presentation. Um, how would you assess the impact of your application uh, on medical education and uh, professional development? So I think that a student or resident trainee would be able to have a very standardized training if there was a training module that people could do that would ensure the skill set that you need at the end of it. So this would be very significant for, um, for, for training of students and, and radiology residents. And uh, who, who, uh, who would be your preferred partner for this application to have uh, a long lasting and uh, significant impact on radiology education in the US first and worldwide? In terms of company uh, or? It could be company or academia, uh, institutions, um, uh, I can any, see, any I can definitely position. see RSNA, uh, I can definitely see RSNA building something that is like this with uh, profiles just like LinkedIn and Facebook, people have their profile, but something professional and related to radiology. And, uh, you know, just everybody has to go through the board's exam as well. So maybe ABR, ACR has modules that they, they, uh, that they, have available for people. So it would be interesting for ACR as well. So I see one of the three societies to, uh, you know, being interested in this. Thank you. Thank you. That was team number four, Pokerad Gemify Radiology. 
Next, we have team number five, that is team one qubit. The project is to create a low cost AI radiology triage system that physically requires only a smartphone, a Wi-Fi router, a Raspberry Pi 4, based on previous AI work for chest radiograph from the same team. And team one qubit, as soon as you're ready, take it away. Hi everyone, my name is Anush Sharvan. I'm, uh, you can call me Anoush. I'm calling you from uh, beautiful Vancouver today. Um, along with me, I have my team members. So let me just do uh, share my screen. Before. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, we're calling the project sort of Pi. It's a bit of a little visual pun. If you like visual puns, we got we got more of those coming up. Um, so and the team includes uh, Seva Ratchenko. Ovid, Durbalau, Savio Montero, and myself. Uh, it's worth noting that Ovid and Savio have just joined the company like less than a month ago, and they're already participating in this hackathon. So um, really, really new team here. And uh, we are essentially, all of us are software developers, and we work in the healthcare division at OneCubit. Uh, we take the machine learning models that are developed by our data science team, and then we build applications and the necessary infrastructure. Uh, required to deploy them in, in, in different scenarios. So a bit of a background, uh, you know, we didn't develop this model, machine learning model over, over the last 48 hours. We are using something that we have before. It is, it's an in-house uh, deep learning model that identifies lung abnormalities and chest x-rays. Uh, it's very similar to that project team one, I guess, with the, with the trachea abnormality detection, it's, but we're, we're focusing on the chest abnormality. We're calling it X-ray, and it has been certified as a class three medical device by Health Canada. So in the production setting, the model is deployed as a service-based application that, that behaves as a, a DICOM application entity. So it can accept C stores or CMOs, and it's, a, it's an SCP. And internally, we have also tried deploying the model behind a, like an API on the cloud. Uh, we use Azure. So Kind of this is a sketch of our production deployment model of X-ray, where you know you have a PAX that sends a C store to a DICOM listener. Uh, that is the application entity I mentioned. This creates the job in the job queue and also stores the image to disk. And then we have a uh, one or multiple workers that could then uh, crunch through those those uh, images and send the uh, the result back C store back to the PAX. I didn't include that uh, that in the diagram here. For the cloud API model, uh, it's a very similar thing. Instead of a PAX, you just have a REST client that interacts with, with, with REST uh, using get and post uh, uh, commands with an API server. We essentially have two endpoints there, one for creating the task and one for the data. Uh, so the data takes, takes storage and needs to be stored somewhere. For a cloud model, when you, you, you first post your image to the data endpoint, that gets stored to the blob storage. And then you create a task for referencing the ID that you that you that you've gotten when you posted the data, and then uh, once the task is submitted to the job queue here, then you have again workers on the cloud that could then um, process the job. Now the cloud platform that we have is it's just internal for internal use. Um, we can't, as has been mentioned before, clinical environments are usually closed ecosystems. So for production deployments, we this is this is deployed on on. Uh, on premises on a VM. So it would be like a Red Hat uh, VM or something like that. Uh, so the problem, what, what, what is the main problem that we're trying to solve, right? So if we can run this, the chess x-ray and ML model on an existing API server on the cloud, can we also run it on a low cost, low powered edge device too? And then the follow-up is, can we use a mobile phone to take a, a picture of a chess x-ray, send it to the edge device for analysis and then receive a response? I mean, the main use case for here is really kind of for humanitarian purposes uh, uh, and, and, and environments where there's low amounts of financial or technical resources, right? So this is kind of the, the sort of rough model of what, what we wanted to, to achieve during this hackathon. Uh, you know, this mobile app here that takes a picture of a chest x-ray, and then it's able to get and post to either the Cloud Inference API or the, uh, the, one, the component that we built here. So this Raspberry Pi via the, the Wi-Fi router is able to, to communicate with the phone um, and accept the jobs. So there are a couple of main components of the software part. So we have the, the, the chest x-ray ML model. It's uh, based on an Onyx runtime. 
The input is an image of a chest X-ray in JPEG form, and then the output is a prediction whether it's there's abnormality or uh, the image is normal. Uh, a confidence score as a percentage, and a sort of resulting image. In our demo, we're going to be primarily showing you the resulting image. That's the heat map overlaid over the original uh, chest X-ray. Uh, the API server it also runs on the uh, the Raspberry Pi. Listens on port 8080 implements essentially the same slash data slash tasks endpoints as our as our main cloud API just for consistency, uh, but it's simplified. So we're not doing all, all the same level of details there. Uh, so and then it calls the Onyx model for the actual inference analysis. And then finally, the mobile app that captures the CXR sends it to some API, whether it's the Raspberry Pi or the cloud, and then displays the result from the API server. So this is the hardware that we end up going with. I, I took a screenshot of actually purchasing this. This is, we're really stretching the definition of like low cost, low power, I guess in this case, it's not a $30 cheap uh, a Raspberry Pi. It is probably the, the top of the line currently at 130 Canadian dollars. And we've got eight gigabytes of RAM in there. Um, and in terms of storage, it's a 64 gigabyte SD card with Ubuntu desktop and ARM64. Uh, we picked eight gigabytes because our model that's it has a minimum of eight gigabytes of RAM memory requirements. And then, as part of the process, we did a quick sprint planning. We broke down the tasks uh, and and assigned it to kind of the three different people here. Uh, Savio handled the, the web app. Uh, Ovid did the RESTful API, and then Steva uh, ported the the X-ray Onyx model onto the Raspberry Pi. And I sort of uh, did the infrastructure work and some of the other tasks. Um, for the Onyx model, the most the challenging part was uh, porting everything to ARM64. We had to compile some of our dependencies for ARM64 as well, and then we had to hack out parts of the model that just could not be converted over to the architecture, or we had to hack it out, um, like remove some of the things that were too heavy in terms of resources. Um, API server, I won't go into too, too much detail here. Uh, it's basically, you, you, you can do a go, uh, post and get uh, against both these endpoints and you're going to get the result back. Um, and then the mobile app is essentially a hybrid app where we have um, the web GUI as predominantly the, the interface, and then we use a native bridge to access the phone's camera. Okay. Now, I think we're ready to do a quick demo. And let me just, uh, we are going to do, do this live. Uh, I'm going to change my camera to this. So. Uh, what you see here is this is the actual uh, Raspberry Pi in the enclosure, and it's hard to install Zoom, to, so I can't really share the screen on 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 the Raspberry Pi. But hopefully, you can see some of this. Uh, and let me just uh, stop sharing here. And share my screen once again. So are you able to sh see this shared screen right now? Yes. All right. So I think we're almost ready. Uh, maybe you have two minutes. Take... Yeah. Can you capture the X-ray? Yep. And then we're going to do this. All right. Starting the timer. Just to have an idea of. So we started uploading at around six seconds. We seeing some result, some uh, activity over here. Okay, here you see uh, an image. This is the original image that we just received. I'll actually open it. Uh, can you open that? Open. One more time. Oh, there it is. Yep. So this is the image that we've uh, taken with the photo. Uh, it's on the Raspberry Pi and. Right now, it's still currently processing. If you could close this now. Yeah. yeah. So the mobile app has submitted the uh, the job. And as you can see here, it's uh, just querying. It's just uh, polling for the, the, uh, the status of that task. In this case, it just says the task is submitted. You have the data ID here, which is the, uh, the same ID as the image uh, name on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, task ID and then the task type, so it's a chest X-ray inference. So 
So there's, I mentioned that in order to get this to work, we had to um, do some trade-offs, right? Like we, we uh, for the production model, we have some extra filtering that we do that, that are also Onyx models. Um, uh, we have one that detects whether it's an X-ray image, like if the image that was submitted is an X-ray at all, or is like an image of a chair. Uh, and then another model that detects the view position, so whether it's um, AP, PA, or LAT. Um, and so we're not doing all of that just to make sure that we have enough resources on the Raspberry Pi. Um, another model that we use is uh, the segmentation model, which essentially um, creates a, a nicer right, map. Right. So we're just, uh, <laughs> if we could get this result back soon, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Yeah, so it does take a while, especially again on the on the Raspberry Pi. Typically, oh, there it is. So if you can scroll down, you see now a uh, the highlight of the heat map, and it's sort of it's growing and changes. And you can see on top it says confidence at whatever percent, right? So we're outputting a GIF of of, of multiple JPEGs with the heat map, and at the lower confidence uh, percentage, the heat map is larger, and then at higher confidence, the, the heat map is more narrow. And just to give you, yes, yeah, so that took about, I mean, let's say less than two minutes, around two minutes or so. And this is the same image on Osiris uh, that we run with the uh, production model. We have a little bit more control. You can see that the the uh, all the, the heat map is actually within the within the long boundary. Um, so that's kind of the difference that we really have of this uh, uh, kind of production model versus uh, the uh, Raspberry Pi, and. Uh, and yeah, if we had a chance to improve it, we'll we'll try to parallelize as much of, uh, as we can to get some more resources out. And I was thinking we could probably pair up with the previous team, the Polkarat. We can probably uh, build a uh, an arcade machine or something that could then just like train uh, train all the other radiology students and stuff like that. So some ideas for future. All right. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, was that was that your presentation? Yes, that is, uh, let me just change the camera back to. Thank you, we have time for one question. Yep. Thank you very much for your time. So th this isn't a question, but I just want to say from my perspective as a pure non-medical uh, patient advocate, uh, I can just see the, the early symphonic sounds of all of this getting out from behind the walls of radiology and into the hands of uh, the, the subset of patients who want to understand all this and learn from it. It's like, please give us, and Pokerot also, give us a way to uh, get in and start learning. Yeah, it definitely wouldn't replace a, a, a true radiologist, but for places that have nothing, absolutely nothing, it might be an actual something useful, right? Do we have Thank time you. for a quick question? Um, we are over time at this okay. at this point. Would, is it okay to do it in chat or maybe yeah, reach out separately? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so that was team number five, team one qubit. Um, next, we have team number six, Mastermind from Marquette University. And this is a uh, an application which pulls JSON reports from the fire server, extract key information, and then send back to in a condition report. Mark, uh, mastermind, as soon as you're ready, please take it away. Thank you. Um, okay, while well, we're bringing up our screen here. Uh, so this year, um, we were actually back on campus today, yay. Um, we are going to uh, have two students present. Um, they both just finished their junior year in undergraduate. On Tuesday of this week, they did not know what a radiology image was and had never heard of fire. So it's been a it's been a pretty interesting week. Um, so first up, we're going to have Juliana, uh, and then once we get to some of the other sections, we're going to have Tyrell. And on that note, I will let you take it away. Great, thank you. All right. So first, I'm just going to start with a little user narrative about the patient. So a 69 year old male with a 60 pack year um, smoking history wakes up one morning with slurred speech, dizziness, and numbness in his right arm. His wife calls 911 and he is taken to the ED by ambulance. The ED physician immediately orders a CT has CTA imaging study. The imaging study is completed. However, this is a small rural hospitals 
um, ED and inpatient services are abnormally busy. This study is sent, um, sent over a secure VPN to a faraway academic hospital to be interpreted by a neuroradiology specialist. So this is just a little background information. So now we're going to talk about the app Mastermind. So we get this new image study, and for and this is a um, what is it the state um, diagram of um, stroke uh, the, the stroke status. the stroke status. So first, um, it's an unknown status, um, and then an AI stroke detection algorithm looks at um, this image and it creates a fire observation, and the status is a draft. And it determines that there is a possible stroke. However, confirmation is needed from um, a radiologist. And then the radiologist will review the images and um, make the status final and say, yep, there is a con confirmed stroke if there is. And then on the right hand side here, we have the stroke team notification, um, which is you can see the yellow possible stroke. This is what will be sent um, to our app mastermind, the user um, interface. Uh, and it has the bed location of the patient. And what we intended for it to do is when you click the patient name, um, it would show the DICOM image to give the um, physicians or the stroke team a little bit of an idea of what is to come. And now we're gonna kind of put this all together um, and an overall um, system architecture of um, our mastermind app. So first we have, the um, diagnostic report is in the SIM Fire server, and this is the back end of our mastermind app. So we um, query for observations and reports. Um, we parse the JSON file and we look for any important information about this patient. We are looking for this um, code, the I-6063. Uh, uh, and then we're going to create a post a condition and a um, communication to the stroke team. And we're gonna put this on the SIM fire server. This is what our app, um, we would like our app to do. Once it is on the SIM fire server, it allows um, our mastermind user interface to take that um, and to update this over here, um, our stroke team notification um, with yellow or red or white, just meaning you know unknown currently. Um, and another aspect that we plan to implement too is the report sent using the SIM Soul server. Um, so now just a little bit about uh, the Python code. So we wanted to use Python to do this. Um, we are importing the JSON library in order to read the report that we got from Smart Reporting. Um, and we wanted to create a program that looks for important information that we need to send to the stroke team. So the ICD code, the patient information. Uh, and then once the code is found, we want to create a communication request and a condition resource to be posted back in the fire server. So that's kind of what we want our Python code to do here. And then I'm going to give it over to Tyrell to talk about how we use SonarCube with our code. Uh, can you hear me? I just can't destroy my video for some reason, so I'm just gonna explain like this. We can so, hear you. Uh, yeah, I ran the Python code uh, for the Sonar Cube um, server, and then like, as you can see, um, these were the results of the tests uh, that we got, and then we uh, we uh, got A's for all of them. And this was also our first time using Sonar Cube, so it was very new to Tyrell and I. Yeah. So um, in the end, we couldn't get, we couldn't, we couldn't implement Sol uh, because we didn't finish like debugging and like uh, making it. But uh, we plan on using the Sol API for like logging what happens with the medical professionals. And, um, uh, and also it should help the process engineers to understand what's happening um, uh, with the timing of everything that's happened uh, with the logging and then of the patients and, and of the doctors. And um, the reason why we have this is to uh, measure the efficiency of each uh, step that I guess, for example, the radiologists uh, do when they uh, try to diagnose uh, their reports. Perfect, thank you.
Um, so now we're going to kind of go over additional use cases. So um, this primary care physician notification, as you can probably see from this slide, this whole notification center that our app is doing, you know, we're sending a lot of different um, reports and we feel like it would be very easy to implement some type of, um, you know, physician notification if needed. So um, ASCII text reports, they use um, NLP to identify findings. And this is given to us from within health. Uh, and in, it's intended to create a fire um, communication request to an ordering physician. So this is another way we can just extend upon um, our mastermind app. Uh, and this, this is not just the only use case. I think our team feels that this can be implemented in so many other ways, not just within radiology, but when, within other aspects of um, the medical field. So what's next for us? So um, as you can see, we didn't get as far as we wanted to with um, our code. We had a few issues come up, but um, I personally learned a lot. Um, and I think I really enjoyed this project enough that I would hope to take it and use it for a concept for a senior, a senior design project this year as I'm going into my senior year. And I think um, we can really work with physicians and hospitals and of course radiologists about what it is they want to see with this mastermind app um, and really make it for the physicians. I feel like a lot of times as engineers, we make things for engineers and that can be a little bit tricky sometimes. We wanna make sure it's um, very user friendly. And we our mastermind app is also open source and can be found with this link here. Um, and that's it for us. So thank you to everyone who's helped from Duke University and the Medical College of Wisconsin. And of course, Terry for telling me about the SIM Hackathon. Um, and this is our team. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Judges? I just want to say I really love this concept and I really love the way that you've kind of tied in different aspects of the uh, of the patient care flow from the stroke team to the future concept of maybe communicating to the primary care physician. Um, and I just, uh, just a comment, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Team number six, Mastermind from Marquette. Next, we have team number seven, Sim Salabim. I, I think I'm, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, the idea is to add a authorization engine to DICOM web using some uh, XCAI shortcuts from Nick Hermans. Nick, as soon as you're ready, please take it away. Thank you very much. Can uh, everyone uh, hear me? Yes. Hello? Oh, yes. Uh, let me uh, just uh, find my uh, screen to share because uh, this is apparently not very uh, easy. <laughs> um, let me see if I can share that. Uh, do you see uh, my screen? Not yet. Yes, yes, we do now. Okay. So, uh, yes, I'm Nick Hermans. I'm from the Flemish Hospital uh, Network uh, KU Leuven, uh, the Catholic University Leuven. Uh, I'm here to talk about my product, Sim Salabim. It's a magician spell, just like Abracadabra, but uh, it uses the word Sim. Uh, I'm trying to uh, achieve uh, dynamic access and uh, authorization to PAX resources using DICOM Web encapsulated by XCA. One of the uh, big problems in sharing medical images is that there are not a lot of authorizations engines uh, available for hospitals to allow access uh, you know, to their uh, PACs over the internet. Um, in Belgium, uh, you know, we see we see this problem a lot, and I decided, you know, uh, during the second time, I'm going to work on something like that. So in Belgium, we uh, have a couple of regional hubs. I uh, author one of them. Uh, it assures that uh, care providers and patients can uh, access uh, information by uh, of connected hospitals and radiologists and labs. Uh, there are four different hubs in Belgium. Uh, at the core, there is the uh, MetaHub. Uh, it's run by our central government that uh, knows uh, the locations where every patient has been in uh, Belgium and uh, can manage uh, consent and therapeutic links and therapeutic uh, exclusions of patients. It's a kind of uh, authorization uh, hub. 
uh, and it connects uh, the different hub systems together. So uh, around the turn of the uh, millennium uh, in 2000, um, uh, the Walloon part of Belgium already uh, created a uh, standard or a system uh, that could be used for sharing uh, documents uh, uh, between hospital systems. Um, during that time, the University uh, of Leuven had uh, a similar system uh, that did not only uh, share uh, documents and but uh, also shared uh, information regarding the entire care process uh, of, of uh, uh, the patient. But uh, during that time, there was no uh, uh, IG profiles available. So it was all based on proprietary systems. How does that system work uh, of sharing uh, medical information? In practice, uh, GP uh, software vendors, they implement uh, the HUB system in a separate tab where they can see all the medical documents inside the uh, Belgian care system. Uh, in practice, in hospitals, they usually em embed a, a kind of viewer that uh, plugs into that system or and uh, also provides patient portals uh, to the entire uh, repertoire of uh, medical images available in the Belgian uh, hub system. Uh, also, hospitals can write their own custom software to interact with it. Um, so uh, each hub uh, has a little bit of liberty on how they implement it. Externally, they have to expose the Belgian standard, but internally they can choose to uh, do it with uh, IHG standards, for example. So our hub is based on IHG standards. Many of the hubs uh, follow the same approach. So they have a central index where you register uh, documents on and where you can uh, retrieve documents uh, from. Uh, by the way, I'm trying to do a, a world record here by uh, trying to explain uh, XCS and XCA in uh, eight minutes. So uh, cheer for me, please. <laughs> um, another way, another way to approach this is to uh, use on-the-fly querying to connect multiple uh, institutions together using the XCA profile. Basically, it enables you to uh, not to use one central registry, but to link multiple registries together and have a uh, kind of custom implementation behind uh, uh, those uh, registries and repositories. So that, you know, what's, so with sharing with uh, radiology images, what, what are the core problems with using, for example, uh, uh, XDS? Uh, XDS, uh, uh, the way that radiology images are stored on the XDS platform is using key object uh, selection uh, files. It doesn't support frame numbers, for example, and uh, it does not, uh, it's not easy because once you uh, register one of these uh, objects, the study is usually uh, updated many times. For example, measurements are added to the study, key objects are added to the study, grayscale presentation states are added to the study, reconstructions, merges and emerges are done. So these key object files need to be constantly uh, revoked and resubmitted on uh, the repository to fix them. Um, so there is a solution to that. Uh, and one of the solutions is uh, the DICOM web. You know, DICOM web uh, is an API so you can retrieve uh, uh, study list information on the fly uh, or retrieve uh, raw DICOM uh, uh, files or rendered DICOM files uh, if you want. Uh, the idea is then to deprecate the provide and register document set of cost objects on central uh, registry and embrace XCA for dynamic, uh, uh, you know, and extended with dynamic responses. Uh, the way that we do this is to create a list of uh, radiology studies on the fly with uh, Qdoa uh, RS or uh, DIMC find. And then when a, a user requests uh, the cost object, uh, create it on the fly dynamically using Qdoa or C find. Then uh, abstract all these things behind the XCA interface so you can plug it into your uh, XDS system. So I have a small demo. Uh, what, what I did was um, basically connect um, the SIM uh, VNA to our uh, responding uh, gateway uh, server by uh, you know reading the uh, DICOM tags uh, provided uh, from the uh, Qdo uh, RS uh, responses for uh, uh, on an on image level query and map them to a cost object and create it virtually and uh, also use the, the Qdo RS uh, responses for study list information and create XDS metadata from it. When you combine these things together and you put it in a responding gateway, uh, you end up with uh, the ability to, I'm going to uh, open a patient record and a medical record and open our uh, hub viewer to demonstrate. 
please work. <laughs> uh, so we'll open our hub viewer. It's uh, XDS based. Uh, I will. Uh, here is one of the studies that is uh, detected from uh, the SIM uh, VNA. I will open it using a action. It will open our viewer. And uh, uh, not sure if it's visible on camera. It says that the error occurred while uh, trying to load uh, the image. It says hackathon SIM, uh, Wado URI. Uh, the reason it's not working is because I did not implement uh, the API key of uh, uh, the SIM hackathon on our production uh, system. That was a little bit uh, too cumbersome. So I have the same URL here in a uh, paste. And I'm just going to paste it in uh, my Google Chrome here. Uh, or not my private Google Chrome. I will paste it here. Hopefully it works. Yes. <laughs> I, I, oh, I need to enable <laughs> the API key, which is now public to everyone. <laughs> ah, there we go. I will show you the uh, breast image. All right, so uh, originally I started, uh, I wanted to implement a custom rule engine directly on top of Kudo RS and uh, Dicom Web uh, that uh, uh, uses JavaScript to determine the access control so that uh, hospitals could more easily uh, enable access to their Dicom Web servers over the internet. However, I ran into uh, many stops and uh, problems along the way. So I died, decided to recycle uh, the access control uh, system uh, inside my XDS uh, infrastructure based on uh, SACMAL and uh, patient information policy systems. Are there any questions? Thanks for your attention. Uh, did, did I succeed to kind of uh, scrape uh, <laughs> XDS and uh, XDA uh, in, uh, in 10 minutes? Well, we'll let the judges speak for that. Um, judges? Yeah, I think you did. Uh, this is Kevin. Um, so uh, if I understand, then uh, you're doing XDS, but without a static registry that's populated sort of case by case, you're building it on the fly when someone asks. Is that correct? So, yeah, we're doing both of them. So uh, we're doing both for the smaller hospitals and for the smaller non-enterprise packs. We build a, uh, we let them re register to a central registry. But for the larger hospitals, we try to not do that. Uh, because of the reasons uh, I said, yeah, and, and, uh, and I you... build it dynamic uh, based on uh, the responses from uh, either uh, C Find, Tim C Find, or Kudo RS, uh, or other proprietary uh, ways for retrieving uh, uh, that, uh, that information. Sometimes we also use uh, responding gateway queries if the pack supports it, like a Fuji packs, for example. And do you have any thoughts on potential performance issues in, in doing it on the fly and on sort of data uh, correlation issues? I guess when, when you find slight mismatches in records on the fly uh, that might need sort of adjudication, any, any thoughts on those? Uh, well, because it, we use the PIX profile and a kind of a discovery system, we don't query PAXs if we know there's no data there, right? So we try to uh, minimize the loads on the PAXs that way. And of course, small PAXs or small hospitals, they don't have a lot of patients visiting there, so they don't get a lot of queries. Of course, it's possible that the connection timeouts occur because PAXs might be remotely. We don't do a central big silo of PAXs, but we distribute our PAXs. So yeah, there, there are some problems with that, but generally uh, using you know smart caching and these things, uh, it fades away. It, uh, the, the, the benefits of having this system where you can share images freely on the internet in a secure and safe manner away the problems uh, of uh, sometimes these images not being available because if you don't do this, your images will never be available. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Are there any more questions? Thank you. That was uh, Nick Hermans, team number seven, Sim Salbim. Next, we have team number eight, interactive image segmentation for easier image annotation. Uh, it's a web app that can be used for, to support people by, uh, through the annotation process with the use of an interactive image segmentation algorithm presented by Soterios. I, I'm going to butcher their name, Guta Kandisas. Uh, so, Soterios, as soon as you're ready, please take it away. Yeah. So, can can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, so hello to everyone. Um, just a very short introduction about me. I'm a software developer. I have no experience with um, radiology and this kind of things. Uh, I actually found out about the hackathon three days ago and I, I thought it would be interesting to come up with an idea and try to solve a problem. But of course, like in three days uh, and being the only developer, uh, it's not so, so easy. So anyway, I thought about, is there anything that I can do uh, uh, that solves a problem and I can present it uh, in a nice way? And the idea that I came up with, uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Uh, um, my presentation is not so professional as the other people. <laughs> so you'll have to excuse me about that. So uh, nowadays it seems like uh, for whatever problem you have, you just uh, develop a machine learning model, you train a model and then you have your solution. Uh, but uh, what- So Terio, if you're sharing your screen, we, we, we can't see your screen. Ah, okay. No? Yes, better. Okay, so yeah, so um, like I said, uh, it seems like the nowadays for whatever the, there is a problem, we just train machine uh, learning model, and then you kind of solve your problem. Uh, but if you speak with people like data scientists, a lot of them will tell you that uh, usually it's not so difficult to actually train an efficient model that does a specific job but rather fi find quality data to, to train this model because uh, the, the precision of the model, how good it performs, highly depends on the quality of the data you use to train it. And, and most of the times uh, uh, finding this data is difficult and it also requires a lot of manual work, uh, like going through the data and clean them and try to annotate them. And like I said, this can be very frustrating for, uh, uh, from time to time. And my idea was like, okay, uh, maybe I can develop a web application application that is uh, easily accessible and supports the user during this annotation process uh, by, uh, um, yeah, by image data. And um, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to show you a little bit this uh, GUI that I made uh, in these past two days. So basically the idea is you have uh, you have this web application uh, runs on the browser. Uh, you choose a file, you press this button, choose file, and you choose a file. And after you have chosen the file, uh, it will appear here in input image. Now, of course, you see a flower, it's just for, for the presentation, uh, you, we, of course, uh, uh, radiology images can be used as well, but here it's just to make a, a, a point. So you choose the image, you see it uh, displayed in, in, on your browser, and then um, you have on the right uh, these uh, seats, uh, these radio buttons. So basically, uh, when you uh, choose one of these, then you can go on the image and, and draw some strokes to give to the segmentation algorithm some information what you consider to be an object of interest and what you consider to be background. Uh, because if you were trying like to segment manually this uh, uh, um, a flower and like put an annotation on it, it's gonna be very difficult because uh, because of the shape, it's, it's, uh, it's not so easy. So here I just, the user needs only like to, to paint some strokes and say, okay, uh, the flower is what I'm interested in and the other things that are uh, the, with painted with a red color belongs to the background. So uh, the algorithm knows what, what is foreground and what is background. And after you have finished with this, uh, uh, with um, painting the strokes, which takes, I don't know, just a few seconds, I would say, uh, you just press the segmentation button and then the segmentation takes place and you, you get your segmented image and you have your segmentation mask, very good. And then uh, you can use it like to, to annotate it uh, without, uh, without problems. Um, so yeah, that is the, the basic idea. 
um, uh, I will just show you here some examples how, how the algorithm works uh, um, with some, some data. Not always will the, the results be good. Uh, this is a very basic implementation. I haven't optimized any parameters, just a very, very basic implementation. Um, I will first choose the image that I showed you in my presentation. Uh, I uh, yeah, chose the image, now I go here, I choose foreground, and I say, okay, look, uh, this part, uh, um, the, the pixels, uh, that have this color um, belong to the, the object that I'm interested in. I just mark some parts here to give information to the algorithm. Hey, this belongs to the background. And then I press the segmentation. And now the, the algorithm is, is doing the segmentation and you get the result. This is, a, I have to admit, a, a, um, an easy match. So the, the algorithm performs pretty well. And now I'm going to choose another match. Uh, um, um, I don't know, maybe this one, it's going to be a little bit more demanding, I guess. Just again, we just throw here a few parts in the background. Say, okay, look, here's the background. We press the segmentation. The algorithm takes around five, six uh, seconds, uh, depending on the image. Uh, but uh, if the implementation is efficient, it could only last, it could take only milliseconds, for example. Um, now I'm gonna choose another, a little bit more challenging image, uh, just to show some limitations. Uh, and the final image will be a radiology image. Uh, so again, uh, here you have Messi, you just paint here and say, okay, look, uh, this is what I'm interested in. And this is the background and I press the segmentation here. Probably the simulation will not be that good, but I have the possibility to go here and mark again, like see which part wasn't segmented so good. Uh, give a little bit more information to the algorithm, press again segmentation. And now with the uh, new information, hopefully the segmentation improves. And I'm just showing all this, um, like I said, because of the, um, um, annotation uh, difficulties that there are. So um, this algorithm could be used like for um, um, uh, organ segmentation and for 3D organ segmentation for educational purposes as well. Um, here I'm going to show you the example in uh, trying to seg segment the, the lungs. Two uh, minutes left. Yeah. And here I'm gonna say, okay, I'm not interested in this and this. Okay, so I will perform segmentation. Here is gonna be, I'm guessing the result not so good. Uh, it's more challenging this one, uh, but the algorithm uh, can further be uh, uh, improved. And then I can go here. Like I said, it's a very basic implementation. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, foreground. I need to mark this here. So background again here and press the segmentation again. Takes a little bit of time, like I said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that is the idea uh, to provide a web application that helps the user to do uh, the annotation uh, as easily as possible uh, using standard web technologies. Uh, some of the things that I would like to do in the future is, of course, to improve the algorithm uh, in terms of speed and precision. Uh, there are uh, uh, publications that can help me with that. And I just wanted to, to show you a little bit uh, how a 3D segmentation could look. Again, like for educational purposes, let's say you have a tumor that has a certain kind of physiology and you would like to show to your medical students, something like that would be possible with a segmentation algorithm that I just presented. And yeah, that's it, uh, more or less for, for my presentation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, judges, comments, questions?
Uh, question, I guess. Uh, so is the segmentation working off uh, intensities or textures or edge detection? Um, uh, there are different kinds of information that you can actually uh, incorporate in the algorithm. Now I'm only using intensities, which is why in the in the um, uh, in this in the last image uh, it had a little bit of difficulty segmenting uh, uh, the the lines uh, with a good precision. Uh, but in general, the more information uh, I, I I put into the algorithm, I combine. Uh, into into the algorithm, the better the segmentation, of course. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you. That was team number eight, interactive image segmentation for easier image annotation. Thank you, Soterios. Mm -hmm. Next, uh, we have a non-competing entry. Number nine is a non-competing entry. It is called Snaz My Rad by Nick Hermans again. Um, Nick, welcome back. Uh, thank you for having me a second time. Uh, I'm going to try to present my screen when you guys see, uh, when everyone sees my screen. Please holler. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, what I want to demo, there was a, a discussion going on saying that, look, uh, uh, medical imaging and um, uh, Healthcare uh, uh, is not always about uh, sadness, uh, about uh, bad news. Sometimes it's about good news. And uh, that really, uh, you know, Dave gave an idea that said that why, you know, can we just easily look at uh, radiology images and just like uh, make a puzzle out of it or make a greeting card so you can print it on your printer or send it to Walmart or whatever and have them uh, print out uh, gift cards for nice occasions. Or uh, just uh, if you're on a skiing trip and you break your leg and you say you want to you want to share it on Facebook, right, with a with a small uh, filter in front of it. So I uh, did a kind of a ten minute implementation of an example of that. This is my medical records uh, using one of our patient profile uh, uh, portals. I'm going to open. Uh, I tried to do it with my wife, but she's putting the baby to bed. So I'm going to use uh, an echo abdomen of myself. Uh, just pretend that that's a uh, uh, a baby <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm going to just uh, paste my code in here I could not uh, change uh, our production system I will get a, a file chooser I can choose a, a, an overlay that I then can uh, uh, put over my image and it's a baby girl <laughs> you can take a screenshot uh, print it on your uh, printer and uh, you know share with your friends uh, and family and uh, have a good time with your radiology images. That's well. That's that's everything. <laughs> As you can see, uh, if we look at the code, because I don't want to steal too much of your time, it's very simple. Uh, <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, it needs a lot of work to be put in our uh, uh, in our uh, actual viewer. But uh, yeah. Um, all right. Thank you, Nick. Judges, comments, thoughts, questions. Okay, well, thank you, Nick. That was team number nine, uh, Sn Snats My Rad is non-competing entry. So that concludes all nine teams, uh, nine presentations for our hackathon showcase. I want to give a shout out to everybody who presented today for the purpose of our People's Choice Award and for the judges to remember who everyone is, I'm gonna tell you about them once more. Team number one, the Trachea Tracker Portable App. Team number two, case tracking project. Team number three, Rosa, radiology on-screen assistant. Team number four, Pokerad, gamified radiology. Team number five is from one qubit, team one qubit. And that is the, that is the smartphone application for, for AI. Team number six called Mastermind from Market. Team number seven, Simalabim, Team number eight, interactive image segmentation for easier image annotation. So thank you again for all the participants for taking the past 72 hours, sometimes more, to, um, to work so hard on your hackathon entries and to make the presentation and share it with us. Thank you for the hackathon committee 
um, for organizing and to and, and make this particular competition possible. Thank you to the SIM staff for who were so, so hard behind the scenes to make sure these all go smoothly and, and it has. Um, thank you for the mentors. Without you, again, most of these projects would not be as complete and as polished as they are. And these continue to be extremely high quality projects that we see year to year. Thank you to, to, to all your uh, volunteerism. And lastly, to the SIM community, whether you are watching this on, re on recording in the future or whether you're here with us today, um, it is based because of your support that the SIM Hackathon gets to, gets to showcase these incredible projects from year to year and continue to share with the community. Um, anybody who is on Slack, um, thank you for participating. And um, this, is, this is Howard Chen. I am your moderator and we are out.